Yo, what up? Welcome to another episode of the Oakland Warriors podcast. I'm Patrick, flying solo. So, your Golden State Warriors have now won three in a row at home on this eight-game homestand, and it feels pretty, pretty good, you know? It feels actually really dang good. They beat the Utah Jazz 112-107 at Chase Center, and before this game, you know, knowing that Clay was going to be sitting out because it was the second night of a back-to-back, he doesn't play those if you couldn't tell, um, the question was, especially after the Charlotte game last night, the question was who else was going to pick up the scoring load with Clay out? You know, you got Jordan Poole and Clay. I've said those guys are the ones that are going to be carrying this team. You live and die with those guys while Steph and Wiggins are out. And it was like, who's going to step up? And a bunch of people stepped up. You know, it was a very solid all around effort. There were some really wild (laughs) lineups out there tonight. It was like, whoa. You know, you're really rolling with these guys. But, you know, overall, you know, this was a game that just like the Charlotte game, you know, I had some people in the YouTube comments say to me that, you know, beating Charlotte was not a big deal. I get it. And I said in uh, that episode that, you know, beating a 9-25 and team at the time, I think they were 9-26 after the loss yesterday of the Warriors, but it's about how these younger dudes and these newer guys are building chemistry and learning how to win, right? That's what it is to me. Yeah, they should beat teams that in general have lesser talent, have less experience, and just aren't as good. And in this one, the Jazz came in 1917 ahead of the Warriors in the standings. And of course, the Warriors are down a bunch of starters in this one. So, you know, these guys had to figure out. I've said when Steph goes out, the new guys, the young guys have to grow. And it's an opportunity to really take on more responsibility for the team winning. You can't just rely on, oh, well, you know, I'm playing like maybe five minutes and I'll just watch Steph score 30 easy points. No, (laughs) you, whomever you are on the bench, are going to have to play 10 minutes, 12 minutes, and you're going to have an opportunity to make a difference, to uh, play defense, play offense, get shots up, and be a part of this Warriors team winning a game. And that's exactly what happened. I'm going to start off with Patrick Baldwin Jr., affectionately known probably throughout his whole life as (laughs) PBJ, definitely amongst Warriors fans. And uh, another YouTube commenter, a couple of folks actually had said that maybe we'll see PBJ um, more in coming games. And I was like, you know, maybe, especially in this one when the Warriors were missing Clay. And I said, if they don't have enough scoring, if Poole might be having an off night, then I could see PBJ coming in, you know, Kerr putting him in the game and getting off some shots just to see if he could get hot. It wasn't exactly that scenario per se. It was more that Jonathan Kaminga got into some early foul trouble and then eventually fouled out. So Kerr had to put someone else in his spot in order to not kind of blow up his uh, minutes rotations and everything. And PBJ was great. (laughs) He was really good. Uh, 13 minutes, four for seven from the field, three for five from three, uh, four boards, and 11 points, plus 13 on the night. The highest plus minus on the night by by far in this one. And, uh, you know, what Patrick Baldwin Jr. has is an obvious skill. He is 6'9", 6'10", and he has a very pure three-point stroke. So he's going to have a long career no matter what in the NBA, as long as his shot never leaves him. But what's great about him is, as some of you may know, most of you probably know, is uh, he's a son of a coach. He played uh, in college at Milwaukee for his dad. 
had some issues there in the sense that he had a busted ankle and they weren't very good. And that's why his draft stock dropped him to the end of the first round. Again, if you didn't know, in his high school class, in his draft class, like Patrick Baldwin Jr. was, I believe, top 10, maybe top eight, and maybe at some point even higher than that. So he was a really, really highly touted prospect until he hurt his ankle in high school and he didn't play as much. And so, of course, he dropped. But the thing about him is like he is legitimately big. And in terms of athleticism, he's not necessarily like this crazy athletic dude, but he's also not like Davis Bertans or something like that, right? Not just some guy who's completely slow footed. He looks like he can move. And as the years go by, he could probably improve his foot speed a little bit, but you know, seemed to be on people on defense and didn't get too lost and whatnot. So these are all encouraging signs. He seems like a heady player. And I'm guessing that as time goes and he gets more playing time, whether it be like later in the season or during the stretch while Steph is out or next season or whatever, that we're going to see a little bit more flair from him because, you know, just he has this makeup where it's like, I think he has some craftiness. So we'll see. We'll see. But it's just a tantalizing kind of prospect to have on the Warriors bench. Again, he's part of this young group of people that a lot of Warriors fans are really, really angry about this <laughs> this two timeline thing where they have uh, not just the lottery picks, but they picked up two more rookies this season. But, you know, hopefully after tonight, they're like, oh, okay, he's actually pretty good. <laughs> and he could probably help sooner than maybe a Ryan Rollins. And he definitely has a good feel for the game. And that's really, really important, especially when, as we all know, uh, we've had guys like, or we have guys <laughs> who have had feel issues, whether you want to look at Wiseman or Kaminga. Kaminga is beyond that at this point, And Wiseman is slowly but surely digging his way through that. So, you know, good on them there. Jordan Poole, solid again. He, again, was pushing the issue and was really, really taking it to the basket as much as he could. He was 10 for 12 from the line, only two of 10 from three and just seven of 22 overall, uh, six turnovers, but he had 26 points. And again, you have to live and die when Clay's not there and Steph's not there and Wiggins isn't there. You, you live and die with Poole. He has to do uh, what he does. And in this case, it was, you know, taking a lot of initiative and taking some risky shots and uh, trying to attack the basket. So, you know, I'd love it for him to clean it up a little bit more, but that aggression I mean, he's the guy, right? Like, it's like, who else is going to score besides Poole? And so he had to get his shots up. And I'm totally fine with that. That was fully necessary in a game like this. Because if he's not scoring the Warriors, even with contributions from other folks, it's like, where else are you going to go, right? Yes, other guys can score. But no one is perceived as the threat that Jordan Poole is on this team in this game with the ball in his hands. You know what I mean? So uh, that was really, really good. And in terms of learning, right, like this came up at the end of the game where the Warriors were hanging on to a lead and then uh, Poole dribbled the ball up the court. Uh, he got a double team um, from the Jazz and they tried to trap him right past half court. And he tried to throw a pass, but it got deflected by Mike Conley, part of the double team, and it was a steal. We see Steph get in that situation all the time, but he – he knows how to pass out of that, right? Poole didn't fake. He didn't do anything else. He just tried to loft it over and that got that got picked, you know? So it's like, sure, we'd all love to see a team just like put on the greatest show on earth and dominate from the tip until the buzzer, the final buzzer, right? But that's not this team. You know what I mean? This team is so different from the other finals teams, the other title teams. And I think you have to take that into account and that this team is currently evolving and that there is a kind of narrative arc to a basketball season, just like last season, right? I said this a couple of weeks back, last season was 
not all sunshine and rainbows. You know what I mean? Like there were a lot of struggles after that 18 and two start after Steph broke Ray Allen's uh, three point shooting record, you know, Draymond got hurt. Steph didn't shoot well for a while. Jordan Poole went into the tank once Clay took over his starting job again. And, you know, they had to build their way up to the postseason. And we know how that ended up. So, you know, that's why, like, looking at this team, you want to preach some patience and some kind of understanding. Yes, this is just three games against uh, a good Memphis team and then two okay to bad, a bad Charlotte team. I'll just say that. And then a decently good Utah Jazz team. But for me, it's like watching these guys grow and seeing what they can put out there on the court, how they perform in pressure situations, in situations where it's like, it's you, you have to perform. You know, no one is walking through that door. Steph ain't walking through that door. I mean, if he is, he's wearing some fancy designer clothes, you know, uh, Andrew Wiggins, Clay Thompson in this one, they weren't going to be walking onto the court. So it's about that growth. And if ultimately, right, right now it's December 28th, the trade deadline is February 9th. If ultimately a move needs to be made, I trust that a move can and will be made. Or they figure out that, hey, maybe we could pick up somebody on the buyout market because we don't need someone to like all of a sudden be the eighth man in the rotation. Right. We need somebody on the fringes in case so and so goes down or in case, like, you know, we have this matchup in the playoffs. That's maybe, hopefully, what they would lean more towards when it comes down to it. But, you know, these are games where these guys are learning how to win. That's what the Charlotte game was about to me. And that's what this game is about to me. I mean, think about it. This was a game for a while, you know, most of the game, (laughs) they were trailing and they just couldn't get over the hump. Right. The Jazz kept hitting big shots. They kept hitting a ton of threes. I was like, they're not going to hit that many threes the whole game. And it felt like they kept hitting threes and stopping any any kind of rally that the Warriors had, right? Any run just got shut down. But part of this, you know, again, learning is to keep going and to get over that hump and know that you can over come a team like this, you know, a team like the Jets, you know, like we talked about how a worry of the road losing streak, you know, was that they would start, the Warriors would start developing kind of like these uh, losing habits or accepting losing. And these wins are signs that that's not the case. And that's important. And Kerr always talks about and always does. Remember how he inserts guys from the end of the bench into games during the regular season because from his experience as a guy who was at the end of the bench during his career, it's like giving those guys minutes to make sure that they're, you know, they have court time that they, if they need to be called upon, then they're ready. You know, they're not just like, Oh my God, I haven't played in six months. So if you think about it, that's what the equivalent of this is, right? It's like basically giving all the bench dudes an opportunity to get on the court, feel themselves on the court so that maybe when everybody's healthy, knock on wood, everybody will be healthy. But when they're all healthy, that uh, when they're called upon, if Patrick Baldwin Jr. has to be called upon in March to win an important game that decides like seeding or something like that, that he's confident enough that the team is confident in him enough and that Kerr's confident in him enough to be like, go out there, shoot your shot. So to me, that's all really, really important. And when you look at someone like James Wiseman, you know, like everybody's favorite topic, it's like he played okay. You know, he's like learning. He had some moments on defense where it felt like he was kind of out of position and Jordan Clarkson kind of took advantage of, you know, his mid range game and like drawing him, out or letting him kind of get too far under the basket. But, you know, he had some good run. He had some good run. And the thing I'll say about James Wiseman is, is anyone out there, no disrespect to Jamichael Green, but is there anyone out there saying, man, they really miss Jamichael Green? You know, like think about that. Because a couple weeks back before Steph got hurt, to me, after the Celtics game, I was like, the Warriors in their rotation, 
where I talk about, you know, the top six with pool at six and then DiVincenzo can make it seven and eight. And then the ninth spot, I'm like, Jamichael Green is kind of like the guy that I don't really, really believe is that kind of dude for the Warriors. So he was a big question mark. I was hoping that James Wiseman could become that guy. And while he hasn't really solidified it yet, uh, I'm hoping he can. I honestly just am. I'm hoping he can solidify it in the next month. If he goes down to the G League, fine, right? If he has to, fine. But he's getting those reps in this one. He's developing some chemistry with uh, Jonathan Kaminga, especially, and Dante DiVincenzo. So I'm not sitting there being like, man, if Jermichael Green was in this game, we would not be down by 10. You know what I mean? Like, again, no disrespect to the dude. Like, <laughs> I enjoy his uh, Instagram feed. His Instagram story is pretty funny. But Wiseman, seven minutes, two for four from the field, four boards, one steal, one foul, minus two on the night, four points. That's fine. That is totally fine. You know, minus two, not too bad. He was plus one in the previous game. And, you know, he's getting in there and he's eating up minutes. Plain and simple. You know, it's funny. There was a, a lineup out there where it was the three lottery picks. So Wiseman, Kaminga, and Moses Moody. And then the two two-way guys, Anthony Lamb and Ty Jerome. And whenever I see that lineup, I'm just like, dang, dude. The three lotto picks and then the two guys that uh, most Warriors fans didn't want even to make the squad, right? Everybody wanted Kendari Witherspoon or Pat Spencer or Mac McClung or something else. But you're looking at that and you're like, wow, okay, they're rolling these dudes out. And, you know, this is is part of the growth. This is the part of the growth of the team. So that when Steph comes back, when Wiggins comes back, it's like, okay, I could pass the ball to you because I know you're going to do something good with it. Uh, speaking of Ty Jerome, props to that dude because he just – his floater game is nice. <laughs> I'll say it. I've been trying to deny it this whole time, but that dude can hit shots. 30 minutes, 7 for 14, only 2 for 7 from 3, 7 boards, 2 assists, 1 steal, 17 points plus 6. I mean, again, the Warriors don't win this game without contributions from guys like him. Anthony Lamb got the start. Three for eight, only one for five from three, but he had 10 points, four boards, three assists. And in the previous episode, I said, these guys are pretty much taking the place of JTA and Damian Lee. And after this one, and th after thinking about it for a minute, it's like, you know, no disrespect to uh, the former Warrior guys, but like they had their strengths, but, you know, they had their <laughs> limits. And it's almost like Lamb and Jerome are just better versions of those two dudes, some strengths and weaknesses across the board comparatively. But, but I am impressed so far and I don't know what the two way, uh, how many games they have left or if they're going to get signed or if they have to get signed to regular contracts or something like that. But they really are <laughs> putting in the work and in the, in this kind of game, it was really, really important. And props to them, two games in a row for being needed and not folding. And not only not just folding, but really, really standing up tall and being like, yo, I'm on this team and I'm going to help this team win. I mean, those two dudes were in the closing lineup at the end of the game. Yes, Kaminga fouled out and he would have been in there instead of Anthony Lamb most likely, but they were there and they helped close out this game. It, Anthony Lamb, he had that fast break, kind of slow motion, <laughs> fast break between two jazz guys at the basket and put up a layup and it went in. And that's something only guys that really know how to play basketball can, can do that stuff. You know what I mean? Yes, everybody in NBA can can play ball, but like, you know, just having the wherewithal, the, the cojones and the skill to actually pull that off, like, good, good for him. Shout out to Kevon Looney, 26 minutes, three for three from the field, 12 boards, five assists, six points. You know, so this one is uh, solid, solid all around. You know, Kaminga, 21 minutes, three for nine from the field, three for five from the line, four boards, three assists, one steal. 
Uh, like I said, he fouled out with nine points, but he's being looked at with this roster without the guys who are out. He's looked at as <laughs> that guy, you know, that he's needed to come in and make things happen to get rebounds, to put pressure on the rim, to keep the defense, the other team's defense on its heels. And you could feel like when he fouled out, it was like, oh, oh no, oh no. And I said this at some point last season, and maybe I'll say it again for new listeners. It's like last season, I said the Bay Area athlete that Jonathan Kaminga reminded me of the most his rookie year was Terrell Owens, a young Terrell Owens before he got all weird and stuff. You know, that's because like, is this dude who kind of came out of nowhere, right? Like, of course, Terrell Owens was a, you know, small school, like late round pick, whereas Kaminga was a lottery pick. But like, you know, just so physically gifted and so much more like just talented in that respect than a lot of dudes. And yes, there's a long way to go for him, but just seeing it start click for him was like, Terrell Owens, when he started realizing that he was like, whoa, I'm bigger and faster than everybody else on the field, it just changed everything, right? And then kind of the same with Kaminga. It's like he knows he's athletic, but once he realizes how he can really help the team win, how he can affect the game in a positive way, then it's just uh, going up from there, right? It's like once it clicks, it's like the growth is, you know, I don't want to say exponential, but it will be much more quicker than it had been up until, say, a month ago, right? I always talk about that Dallas game, and that's the one where I was like, yo, this dude gets it, and he's graduated from his rookie season finally. You know, this is the dude that we'd hoped for at the beginning of the season. It just took a month and a half, a couple months or so to to get there. So, Another thing for Kaminga, it's like, again, a learning experience is how not to get into foul trouble and how not to put the refs in position where they can call bad, where they can make bad calls. Like the sixth foul that he got, where allegedly he pushed Jared Vanderbilt in the back on a rebound. He didn't. <laughs> he just kind of raised his arms up, like, you know, like you do when you're anticipating the ball coming off off the glass, off the rim. And as you know, once a defender, once a big man, once a rebounder under the basket feels an arm, an elbow in his back, and once he sees he can't get the ball, he's going to flail. And he's going to try to bait the ref into a call. So I think those are the things where you learn from being on the court. And again, this is the stretch of games where it's like, get these guys reps, get these guys who won't have as big of roles for the most part, get them as many minutes as possible and come away with some wins. And this home setting is the perfect place <laughs> to get young dudes confidence. Yeah. Whether it's Kaminga, Moody, Wiseman, uh, PBJ, you know what I mean? Because benches don't travel that well, especially really young ones. So let them feel themselves and see that ball go in the hoop or, you know, see uh, themselves like defend somebody well, be locked out, whatever it takes and uh, build that confidence, see those pictures of a game and take that and then move on, you know, move on to the road or wherever the next stop may be, maybe G League for PBJ and Maybe Wiseman, hopefully not. Hopefully he sticks with the big league club. And, you know, looking at the final, what, five games, I've said how this stretch of home games is, you know, a bunch of winnable games. And the toughest one was going to be the 41st game of the season, the final game of the homestand, which is against the Phoenix Suns. And if you didn't know, if you didn't hear, Devin Booker is out for at least four weeks with a groin strain, I believe. So you don't want to see anybody get injured, obviously. But in that one, hey, you know, (laughs) you play who's out there on the court, right? Like Steph's not going to be out there. So that gives the Warriors, you know, 
maybe a better chance if you know like if they were to go eight and zero on this homestand, uh, that would be insane. That would be really insane because that would put them at five games over, right? Five games over five hundred, and right now, as of today, five games over five hundred. You know, just taking that difference in wins and losses would put them in fifth place, right? So again, getting ahead of ourselves, but you know, these are games that the Warriors need to learn how to win. And, you know, for fans who are used to blowouts over the years or just like, you know, uh, a squad of four hall of famers walking out and just steamrolling uh, a team of lesser talent, that's not going to happen right now. What we're seeing is uh, what I really, really love to see, which is homegrown talent grow. You know, that's the beauty of, to me, like being like such a, a long time, long term fan from the past into the present and into the future. It's like, you know, these are, <laughs> these are your dudes. These are your guys. You know what I mean? <laughs> and maybe that's just me. I know a lot of folks out there feel the same way, but not everybody. Uh, but this is what makes it exciting, like seeing the joy, the excitement on these guys' faces when kind of they're, they're doing things for the first time. You know, they're taking on the main leadership roles when your, you know, three of your top guys are out. So you'll have to see it. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Good vibes all around. Once again, the Warriors get Portland on Friday. Uh, December 30th at home. And word out is, if you didn't know, Gary Payton II has not played a game for the Blazers this season. And, um, you know, love GP too. But just for all the folks, again, who were like, we shouldn't have given up GP too, and it's it's too much to, to give up. Dante DiVincenzo, 39 minutes, 5 for 11 from the field, 5 for 9 from 3, 4 of 4, from the line, he hit two big clutch free throws in the final minute and four boards, two assists, two steals, plus four, 19 points. Mm. You know, again, love GP too, but like, you know, let's let's embrace what we got here with Dante DiVincenzo, you know what I mean? Like we got him because he was injured. He's had injury issues the same way we got Otto Porter Jr. last year, right? The same way we got Nemanja Bielitsa because of issues like that. So he's a guy who is actually pretty dang good and he's been good. And, you know, and it's not even just like on offense that he's a better guard. It's like, if you remember Gary Payton II, they played him like a center almost. They had him in the corner in the dunker spot. You know, he wasn't necessarily like, yes, you know, the, the, the offense kind of everybody kind of runs and does their stuff and ends up on all the spots on the court. But like he was there and he wasn't necessarily like running what Jordan Poole does or what Clay Thompson does or what Steph does. And Dante DiVincenzo, he's like a true guard. So, you know, again, I'm not bad mouthing in GP2, but just for the folks who were really, really, you know, uh, against the summer moves. Like, yes, I thought the Jamichael Green one would work out a little bit better, but it hasn't. But like the Dante DiVincenzo move, man, like that signing right there was like, boom. Wow, we got that, dude. You know? So we'll see that more and more. And whatever happens to Dante DiVincenzo, he's on a one-year deal. He's going to make <laughs> some good money uh, based on this season thus far. And I'm happy for the dude because he's getting time to shine on probably the most popular team in the league, right? In terms of viewership, right? There's a lot of people who don't like the Warriors, of course, but uh, you know, that's, that's going to be fun to see. And then especially when the other guys get worked into the lineup and uh, seeing how, how all that goes. So uh, anyway, yeah, that's it. I'm gone for now. And uh, I will catch you after the, the Portland game.